It was a difficult task, but someone had to do it. We couldn't use shortcuts. We couldn't afford explosives. Pokemon would refuse to help. So it had to be done with handheld tools. The demolition of Pokemon Tower, that is. I had no hand in making the decision. And even if I quit the job, it would have happened anyway. I needed the money. I was a poor man from Cinnabar. The volcano that made the island in the first place had erupted violently, and buried the town in its heavy ashes. It buried my home. Though neither my wife nor my kids were hurt, I had to raise money to rebuild the house, and my old job as a janitor was gone, ten feet under solidified lava. So, when the news went out that workers were needed to demolish the Pokemon Tower, I obliged. Using our family's lone Pokemon, my starter, Firo, to fly out to Lavender. The small rustic town wasn't as out of place as people made it out to be. It was just barren, and I guess the building of Kanto's very own radio tower instead of tuning into Johto stations was a good idea and would bring business to the town. Anyway, I'm rambling. And it's hard to think of what 20 workers and I were doing. The Pokemon Tower had been standing longer than any of us had been alive. I'd been there one time before, when I was young, to bring an old friend to rest. I wasn't a very good trainer, and, um, I ended up releasing all my Pokemon shortly after the incident with Golduck. He was my purpose for my original visit to the Pokemon Tower. But, but enough about him. It's hard enough being here, doing this, already. The work was nitty-gritty. The task was to completely hollow it out, floor by floor, and disassemble the frame in the same way, and we had to do this from the top down. You're probably wondering about the many graves. Most were empty, to my relief. Only words in the tombstones were left as memories. But some weren't. As we had to remove each and every casket from their place in the floorboards, they had to be opened. As the tower hadn't been open for the public for almost half a year now, none of the corpses were fresh, and frankly, we didn't know what to do with them. I tried not to look, of course, but sometimes I, I just couldn't help it. I would have rather gotten a direct stun spore in my eyes than see some of those bodies. One I remember was a seal, rotten, flesh red and black and had merely a skull, dried red filling the bottom of the grave. And the smell. Oh, the smell. I almost left after bearing witness to the first decayed Pokemon. Especially when I knew we descended from the seventh floor to the fourth, my partner Goldduck would be there. I would be disturbing his rest, disturbing his peace, his soul. Why did I ever take this job? I didn't even like the idea of tearing down the Regis' largest cemetery. Every one of these Pokemon had a story, a trainer, a life at one point. And all they wanted was to rest. The work took a long time, sun up to sun down, for many days. I lost count after a while. Staying in the diminutive hotel really wasn't helping, and I couldn't get a healthy amount of sleep. It wasn't long before I completely resented taking this job. The relatively high pay wasn't enough to make up for the moral crimes us workers were committing. I wasn't the only upset one about the tower. I guess we all needed the money. I told myself that it was going to be worth it. It was going to help my family. As I screwed my eyes shut and emptied the wheelbarrow into the dump. Debris of wood and stone among various rotten Pokemon bodies. When we had worked down to the fourth floor, I tried to stay away from the southern end. I wanted someone else to have to deal with the bones of my past. There were often sounds that came from nowhere, as we slowly, painfully gouged out the tower. Most were soft Pokemon sounds. A warble or a growl or a sob. But some were almost human-like. As I came upon a grave marked with a small spoon, I feared. Correctly. For the worse, when I pulled out the nails from the floor, to reveal the decomposed, shriveled Alakazam. Most of the bodies were smaller Pokemon, Rattata, Nidoran, or Sandshrew. There were several here. They were the easiest to just look away and take care of, since they were small animals. But Pokemon like Meowth and Growlithe 
both of which were also heart-wrenchingly common, pulled a certain string in our hearts. But Alakazam, the body? It could have been mistaken for a human. And the flash of hot fear I felt almost made my lunge come up without warning. I had to take a breather, so I left the site for a few minutes. The image of the curled up psychic type had scarred me. I would never forget it. And I couldn't forget the inevitable either. That the body would be dumped in among with the rest of the junk. I forced my mind to stop wandering when I imagined what could have killed such a strong Pokemon. After my heart rate had returned to normal, I made my way back up to the fourth floor. The stairs were murder on my legs come face to face with the image of a crying Golduck. I jumped and yelled out, almost taking a dangerous stumble backwards down the stairs. The image was gone. The sound of my departed Pokemon remained echoing throughout the tower. I grinned and muttered a pitiful excuse when one man looked over at me. As I turned away though, I saw a Vulpix floating behind the closest man's head. Its eyes were blank with misery. I made the connection with Dread as behind another one was a Pikachu, a War Turtle, and an Electabuzz. I could only guess that Golduck was behind me too, though no one else seemed to see them as I carted out empty grave by empty grave. Without gaining a hold of my sense of direction, I picked up my shovel and my hammer and went back up to an untouched grave. Words weren't illegible. I heard the protest of a Golduck behind me. As my heart dropped to my chest, I couldn't stop the downswing of my arms. The wood covering gave, weakened by rot, and broke inward to reveal a skeleton of him. It was many years ago that the gold that had been taken away from this world. After my adventurous companion disregarded his weakness to electric types, while he explored an abandoned power plant, drew many trainers. Being the clumsy but well-meaning Pokemon he was, Golduck had burst out of his ball, eager to battle, when he bumped into a sleeping Electrode. The angry Pokemon cornered him against one of the many broken-down generators, and before I could recall him, or at least send out Golem to back him up, uh, the Electrode had released such a loud, superconducted thunder attack that I had fallen back and bruised myself. Without pausing, the Electrode fired another one. Through the limp form underneath the suddenly supercharged generator was already sizzling. The Electrode rolled away without care. It was a harsh blow of confidence as a trainer. It was harrowing. Not being able to recall him, having to make my pharaoh carry him to the Pokemon Center, where he was proclaimed gone. I had to walk by foot to Lavender that same day. And now, here I was, an adult, and I'd fallen to my knees with heavy gasps for air between sobs, longing for remorse. The disarming sound caused the rest of the workers to look, most of them accompanied by one of their own lost partners hovering above them. They were silent. Though their own disheveled eyes held much pity, they understood. I lost myself for a short while, in my tears for Golduck. He was the second Pokemon I'd owned, he was... he was my best friend. Then he was gone so fast and so easy, it just seemed wrong. And I was tearing up at the resting place of other people's best friends, it was horrible. Digging out their bodies and piling them with trash, tearing up their peace. The hit my heart took was a deep one, and after my eyes could cry no more, I left the Pokemon Tower for the last time. Destroying the building was wrong. The spirits would have every right to rise against us. Golduck had every right to get me. I pleaded for forgiveness. I bared my heart to him. His presence slowly dissipated. The Pokemon Tower was still being torn down. Eventually, I never got paid. My family was moved in with an old friend. We're doing okay. I told my wife what happened there, and she said she couldn't blame me, and I could never bear to ever get a radio. 
or anything that associated with that place. I could never visit Lavender Town again. It was a few years later, actually, when um, one of the co-workers that stuck around ran into me while I was getting groceries. I recognized him along with the Vulpix who he'd been following. He had told me that he'd gotten a radio, and all he ever heard on it was the sound of his late Pokemon, Vulpix, calling for him. Though his own family only heard radio broadcasts. He said the same thing happened to the other workers, the ones who had also lost Pokemon in their lifetimes. We had never fought against the new radio tower, because the pleas of a small group of men could never overtake the drone of an entire region of people uninvolved. Our people even found a peace and forgiveness after time. They stopped hearing the mournful cries of their Pokemon on the radios. But the rest of people across Kano, whose Pokemon had been buried and then dug up, desecrated, if they ever left their radio on late enough, and listened hard enough, they could hear the pained protesting and growling, the sobs and the wails of their poor departed Pokemon's restless souls.